Have you ever wondered what dark secrets lie hidden in the files of Red Dead Redemption? While this game is full of fascinating stories and richly detailed landscapes, there are also several events and background characters whose origins are often left unexplained. And players who dive deeper into these secrets often end up with more questions than answers. And in this video, I shall attempt to demystify some of these secrets in an iceberg format. We're going to be talking about everything from legit lore all the way to super obscure conspiracy theories that will make your head spin. So without any further ado, let's dive into tier one, which is just the tip of the iceberg. Sometime during RDR2's development cycle, the team at Rockstar clearly intended for Mexico to be a playable section, similar to how it was in RDR1. Early rumors and speculations also pointed to this being true, and fans were looking forward to seeing familiar locations from the previous game with updated visuals and improved NPC interactions. However, in the end, all we got was a superficial backdrop to the main map that can only be accessed through glitches that take you out of bounds. Walking through this barren desert landscape shows us that Rockstar intended for it to be a playable territory, since there are dirt roads and trails, and tunnels that pass through the mountains. Some of the rocky outcrops and structures might also look familiar to those of you who have played the original Red Dead Redemption, and data miners even found game files containing subtitles and dialogue for Mexican NPCs, in addition to ambient music that's exclusive to Mexico. It's a shame we never got to explore Mexico as Arthur, but I guess that would have been too much work for an already strained dev team that was working overtime to get RDR2 out in a polished state within the stated deadline. Next up, we've got references to Red Harlow here, who's the protagonist of Red Dead Revolver, and he's mentioned within both RDR1 You heard of that Red Harlow fellow? He was one of those men. And RDR2 as a legendary gunslinger, sort of like a mythical figure. He used to tell me stories about Red Harlow. Yep, you've probably heard of him. Legendary bounty hunter bringing the savage outlaws of the frontier to justice. Man who watched his parents get murdered in front of him as a boy, but who uses that pain to become a better man and ultimately to wreak his vengeance. Rockstar claims that Red Dead Revolver isn't canon to the story of the Redemption games, even though it takes place in the same universe. And I can understand why they make that claim, because anyone who actually has played Red Dead Revolver knows that its fantastical characters and wacky setting aren't really compatible with the more grounded, realistic vibe of Red Dead Redemption. Then again, midget clowns, teleporting magicians, and giant 500 pound sumo wrestlers don't sound all that outlandish when you consider the fact that Red Dead Redemption 1 had zombies in it. For a long time, players have known that Abigail used to be a sex worker before she joined the Vanderlyn gang, and is said to have slept with many of the members before falling into a romantic relationship with John Marston, and this is one of the reasons why he ran away from camp after learning that Abigail was pregnant, because at first, John didn't believe that Jack was his child. The true origin of Jack is a topic surrounded by much fan debate, but in the end, does it really matter if John isn't Jack's biological dad? Because the relationship between them runs deeper than blood, and when you consider the fact that John put his life on the line for his family multiple times and raised his boy as a father should, it's safe to say that he is Jack's father for all intents and purposes. Besides, if you play RDR1, strangers constantly comment on how much Jack looks like John. Even the gang members like Dutch, Hosea, and Arthur all say that they know John is the father. So John, I was talking to little Jackie. There's a fine boy you got. If he's mine, of course he's yours. It's the truest of gifts, a child. Far be it from me for interfering in your business. But the boy is your business. I know, but... No. No buts. We're at the end of tier one, and here's a fun little factoid for you. Originally, both Eliza and Isaac were supposed to play a much bigger role in the game's story, because Mary was introduced as Arthur's love interest. And if you don't know, Eliza was the first woman that Arthur loved, and he even had a child with her. But both the mother and her son were killed by a gang of bandits over a sum of just $10. Now Roger Clark, the voice actor as well as motion capture artist for Arthur, states that in the beginning, Arthur was supposed to have a newborn baby who freezes to death while traveling to Coulter during the prologue. There's also an unused object called Baby Intro, which looks like a newborn wrapped in a blanket. 
And as for Eliza, her model also exists in the library of unused assets within the game, and we know it was repurposed for Mrs. Sinclair. Okay, now we're into tier two, which means things are about to get a lot spicier. For starters, here's what Arthur used to look like in the beta phase of RDR2's development. I wouldn't exactly call him a pretty boy, but neither is the final version of Arthur that we got. It's interesting to note though how this early version of Arthur matches the official artwork much more closely here, particularly when you pay attention to the jawline and the nose. And while we're on the topic of Arthur Morgan, let's talk about that one time he found a time-traveling geologist. Francis Sinclair can be met if you do the Stranger mission Geology for Beginners. And upon first glance, he just seems like a socially awkward or slightly eccentric man who wants you to go around collecting important artifacts for him. But as you progress through the missions and engage more and more with the man, it becomes somewhat obvious that he knows a lot more than what he's letting on. For starters, he often uses slang that only became popular during the early 1900s. Well, what's eating you, partner? Well, it's sort of very complicated, and you'll think I'm jazzed if I tell you. You what? If I told you, you'd think I was on the hooch. A good decade after Arthur's time period here. Secondly, he has this mural inside his house, which depicts historical events on the right side and futuristic tech on the left side with a portal in the middle. And finally, when you ask Mrs. Sinclair where her husband went, she tells you that Francis is right here while showing the baby in her hand. I was looking for your husband. My husband? He's dead. He's been dead since just before Francis was born, one year ago. Your husband Francis is dead? No, this is Francis. My husband Tom is dead. Which means this man is actually the future version of the baby that you see right in front of you. Francis's business cards also have a logo of an hourglass with wings on it, signifying the combination of two elements, time and travel. This is a huge nod towards the theory that he is indeed a time traveler. Alright, next we need to talk about the mythical fairy to Guarma, which you were supposed to access during the epilogue. This is evident from a line of unused text in the game files that says buy ticket to Guarma for $100. Now some people have speculated that the ticket stand in the San Denis port, which is permanently closed, was originally intended to give you access to steamboat travel. And Guarma itself was also supposed to be much larger if you look at an image of the full map in which there are multiple smaller islands surrounding the main island. San Denis also looked a bit different during development here, and it was actually called New Bordeaux, based on the leaked map from 2016. However, as you know, Mafia 3 also has a town called New Bordeaux, and it's based on New Orleans. Rockstar probably changed the name to San Denis at the last moment to avoid any confusion with another 2K property because Mafia and Red Dead take place in different universes. Now that we're in Tier 3, things might start to get a little confusing, but stick with me. First, we've got an unused cave camp in Guarma called El Hueco, which was supposed to be a hideout for the gang while they were stranded on the island in Chapter 5. We are on the island of Guarma. And this camp was designed with two entrances that could have been linked to a series of underground catacombs, kind of like a dungeon level. But we'll never know, because it got scrapped from the final release. Then we've got something really freaky here. You guys know how Molly was killed by Miss Grimshaw after she claimed to be a snitch, right? Well, later we found out that it was Micah who was the snitch, and Molly was just drunk and trying to get Dutch's attention, which sadly got her killed. Afterward, they burned her body instead of giving her a proper burial. Get this body out of here and get it burnt! Okay. But if you go into the game files, there's an object called Molly Grave, and it can be spawned underground near the spot where she was killed. This tells us that her story might have had a different outcome before the script was changed. Do you remember Jimmy Brooks, the scared civilian who Arthur can choose to save or kill at the start of Chapter 2 in Valentine? Well, there's something strange about him. So there's this character called the Strange Man, who many consider to be death, as in the physical manifestation of death, the Grim Reaper himself. He has a cabin in the game, which you can visit as both Arthur and John, and when you enter this cabin, you'll find different portraits of animals depending on your honor level, a vulture and a wolf if you're low honor, and a stag if you're high honor. But more importantly, there is also a poem etched into his desk about Jimmy Brooks, and it states that he's not as dumb as he looks. And if you let Jimmy die, the poem will also change to reflect this fact. But that's not all. If you visit the Register Rock, it contains Jimmy's name, stating that he worked for the US Postal Service with the date 1863 written next to it. And considering Jimmy's age based on his appearance, he's probably in his 30s. But if we go by the date on the rock, it makes him far too old, leading some to believe that the Jimmy we save is in fact a ghost. A test by the strange man too. 
We're in tier four of the Red Dead Iceberg now, and at this point, we're dealing with the supernatural. Monsters, legends, and aliens. One such weird occurrence is the cave giant who canonically exists within the game, as he speaks to you from behind a closed off cave entrance. I'm faced with a stark and unpleasant choice. Be lonely or get murdered. Not very exciting as it goes. Now, cut audio files suggest that we were originally supposed to encounter the giant physically, and there are also dialogue files suggesting that he escaped from a circus. You know, really tall guys with acromegaly don't sound so out of place when you realize that the game has literal Neanderthals in it. And while we're on the subject of weird stuff here, how about this? There's a river monster in the game, which has its own audio files. Many believe that the Loch Santos monster, which appears as an easter egg in the Cayo Perico heist, was actually copied from RDR2's cut content. Now for a long time, Red Dead fans have been searching for the mythical third meteorite. We know that three meteorite chunks can be carried, since that's what it says in the inventory, but we only get two in the game. Some rumors even suggest that originally you could make a trinket by combining all three before it was cut from the game, and so if you did so, would that have turned you into some kind of Wild West Thanos? I'm not sure, I don't know, but it is pretty interesting to think about. Also, someone on Reddit found a game file suggesting that the meteorite shard can be picked up by a squirrel, so now there's a whole new theory suggesting that the meteorite is actually contained within one of the six squirrel statues that you find for Abigail. I don't know guys, this is just reaching for straws at this point. Is there a squirrel in the world of RDR2 who mistook the meteorite fragment for a nut? Maybe, but I'm not about to start squirrel hunting anytime soon. It's far more likely here that Rockstar just forgot to add it, or even they decided to keep it a mystery, so people like me and you would make YouTube videos about the third meteorite, but who knows. And there you have it guys, my ultimate Red Dead Redemption iceberg containing at least some of the darkest mysteries ever to be found in the world of this game. With most story driven games that are as large as Red Dead, whatever you see in the public release doesn't represent the full extent of lore and world building that was conceived by the design team during development. A bunch of stuff is often cut or replaced either because it doesn't adhere to the game's vision or because it isn't suitable for a mainstream audience. I bet some of you guys have never heard of most of the stuff on this list, so with that said, which one shot to you the most and would you be interested in a part two covering even more mysteries because there are so many more so let me know in the comments if you like the video don't forget to drop a like on it and subscribe to the channel for more red dead redemption as well as red dead online content as always i hope you have a great day and i'll see you guys in the next video adios amigos